Hello everyone and welcome to our Lecture 17, uh, A-Push, The Roaring Twenties, A Return to Normalcy. And since I have a lot to talk about here, I thought I'd get right into it instead of some of the, the usual silliness that I tend to do. Because, you know, I wouldn't want to bore anyone, I mean, you know, especially in, you know, someone in my seventh period class. Anyways, I want to move on now. And uh, as we go through this uh, particular lesson, I want you to think of two essential questions. Uh, what factors, both international and domestic, contribute to the emergence of the Red Scare? And you can find some of this as well on page 688 to 690 in our textbook. And also, what grassroots conflicts over race, religion, and immigration shaped politics in the 1920s? And that would be found on pages 692 to 696. Yes, I know, we have a textbook. Shake the dust off it and look at it from time to time. Thank you. All right. So let's get into the lesson. So the 1920s, sometimes we call this the Roaring Twenties, the Age of Jazz, but it's also the return of the Republican Party, of the GOP, the Grand Old Party. Uh, they campaigned on what they called a return to normalcy. Uh, what does that word normalcy mean? Is it even a real word? I don't believe so. I think the Republicans made it up in the 1920s and now it's in the dictionary. But it was this idea of actually turning back the hands of time and going back to that great era of the Gilded Age, right? the age of laissez-faire economics, uh, the time period of isolationism, Right. When, uh, when America looked inward and not outward. And that's what the Republicans promised. It, it had been several decades now of progressive leadership. We're coming out of the progressive era. It begins technically with Theodore Roosevelt. So we have uh, his two terms of office. There's a little bit of it with Taft. And, of course, the eight years then of Woodrow Wilson that culminated with World War I, as we talked about earlier throughout uh, that, how progressivism even shaped his foreign policy. For those were, that was a Democratic leader. Now the Republicans have become completely tied to their conservative faction, and they're looking more for a conservative-type leadership now, and they'll find it in 1920 with Warren G. Harding, an Ohio president, the last of the Ohio gang, as it were. And we all know about the Ohio presidents, right? Um, not exactly the best, nor uh, the most memorable of all uh, the presidents. Um, but just a couple of quick things. As I said, uh, one of the things that the Republicans are going to tout or really promote in the 1920s is his return to isolationism, uh, neutrality, uh, the, the doctrine of George Washington, if you will, and one of their first big things they do is this uh, Washington uh, conference that takes place. It begins in uh, November of 1921, and it goes through February of 1922. This is a naval conference. Uh, nine major countries were invited, and it was the first time in history that they were going to talk about reduction of armaments. In this situation, it was, like I said, it's a naval conference, so it was mostly about battleships, the reduction of battleships. Uh, that The major countries, especially the United States, Great Britain, and Japan, who is a, a dominating power in the Pacific, will start to agree to limit the number of battleships that they'll start to produce. So again, here's uh, the Republicans trying to pull away from the world. Uh, this conference was held outside of the realm of the League of Nations. The League of Nations was not involved in this. And I'll give you a few seconds to think why that would be. If this is happening in the United States, what do you remember about the League of Nations, the United States, Article 10? D -d 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 yes, America never joined the League of Nations. So this conference was held outside of the scope or the, or the authority of the League of Nations. And it was held with, obviously in Washington, D.C., so the United States took a major role in this. Again, America did not want to get involved in another big war, and so this is one of the main reasons for this. Uh, the Republicans are going to tout again big business. Of course, uh, Harding has the second greatest presidential scandal of the time, uh, 
We have this teapot dome scandal that we talked about in class, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. This uh, oil reserves in Wyoming, they were reserves for the Navy uh, in an area that the mountains look like teapots, so they call it teapot dome, but this is actually in Wyoming. And they wind up selling this oil reserves to private industry. And people are wondering, well, how did this happen? How did the president allow this to happen? How did the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, get away with this? And we come to find out he took some bribes. Uh, they skirted past the Constitution and just did what they wanted to do. And it became a massive scandal. But Harding, unfortunately, I would say, winds up dying. He has a heart attack while visiting in San Francisco. So we'll never know exactly if he was involved in this or what he knew or didn't know which then brings us to the other president that really his whole presidency is defined by the 1920s, and that's Calvin Coolidge, or is he better known as Silent Cow? Silent but deadly. Oops, that might not exactly fit for that. I don't know. Um, but he's Silent Cow, well, because he rarely talks. I mean, he does give speeches. Every president gives a speech, and, you know, he talks when he has to, but, you know... As I told you in class, the famous story of him having this big state dinner and uh, somebody's wife is sitting next to him and says, Mr. President, I bet I can get you to say more than two words tonight. And he says, you lose and never speaks again. Silent cow. But Americans love this guy. Here's a famous quote from him, and I do want you to know this quote down here. The man who builds a factory, and should be builds a factory. Look at this. I forgot an S in there. The man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there, worships there. Now I'll let that sink in for you a little bit. Now that might be a little too zen for some of you to think about. What does that mean? Now over the years, students tell me they think that, well, industry is becoming religion. Well, remember, this is a metaphor. Um, this isn't actuality. You know, Ford, Ford Motor Company did not become a church. All right? But big business in America is so important to us. It's like building a religion. Right? It's a metaphor. It doesn't mean that the factories actually became temples or churches. Now this is this has become though the the essence of America. And that's what Calvin Coolidge is saying. In fact he would also go on to famously say the business of America is business. So just remember that particular quote as we go on and we talk a lot about um, the 1920s here in the next few days. Also, on the international scene, I put up here also the Kellogg-Briand Pact. We had that Washington Conference of 1921-1922. Here now is this other big international moment. You have all the major countries in the world sign this agreement. And what is this agreement? Well, it's a promise to never use war to resolve any dispute or conflict. Now, I'm pausing for a second. I want you to think about that. They're promising never, ever, ever, never, 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 nope, never, not going to happen, nope, nope, going to do it, nope, 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 never, never, never going to use war, ever, 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 to resolve a dispute or a conflict. Cross my heart, stick a needle in my eye, you know, never, ever going to do this. By the time World War II breaks out, the United States is the only country still honoring this thing. It's a silly agreement. But again, it was, a, it was a way of America trying to stay isolated. By, if there no war is formed in the Pacific or in, the, or in Europe, then America doesn't have to worry about anything. So these are two of these moments, both the Washington Conference, the Kellogg-Briand Pact six years later, of trying to enforce isolationism on, on America by the Republican Party. Um, the 1920s is also the height of what's known as the first Red Scare. There's two big Red Scares in American history. Uh, the 1950s will be the second one. Of course, that will come in a few weeks. But uh, 1919 especially, the war in Europe, the Great War, the war to end all wars that will make the world safe for democracy, la, 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 la. Well, it also brought about a Red Scare. When we say the word red, uh, we're not saying that people are actually afraid of crayons or anything like that. What we're saying is uh, world communism. Communism has spread. Uh, the Once uh, czarist Russia went through a revolution, and now they are the Soviet Union. Uh, 
And this doctrine of world revolution, of world communist revolution, is starting to be uh, talked about and spread throughout Europe, throughout Europe and Germany after the war, and France and parts of Italy. There are individuals who are talking openly about uh, communist revolutions. Uh, this is also mixed in with the anarchist movement that started in the late uh, 19th century and is now we are in the early 20th century. And after the war, a lot of immigration starts to come to America. And the majority of these immigrants are coming here simply for uh, looking for jobs, looking to make a better way of, of life for themselves. Some of them are going to get jobs and want to eventually go back to their country of origin. But Americans get scared. Uh, they get very scared thinking that communists are going to take over the world. Uh, A. Mitchell Palmer, he became the attorney general under Woodrow Wilson, and he was very, very much afraid of this situation. He really, really thought there was going to be all these communists coming. And we have a situation where he starts to be proactive and goes after what he thinks are communists, the Palmer Raids. They actually begin in late 1919 and they carry over to 1920. And I, I want to read an excerpt from a book here. For just a second, let me get it. I left it on my other table. Um, Palmer received some $500,000 from the government in order to uh, create this agency that becomes... Uh, the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, which is the precursor to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Have you ever heard of the Federal Bureau of Education? Uh, perhaps you know it better as by its initials, FBI. Uh, this is August 1st of 1919. He put in charge of this. Uh, now, within the, the Department's Bureau of Investigation, you get the General Intelligence Division, headed by a 24-year-old Washington-born lawyer, J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover becomes the founder of the FBI. Uh, the first series of Palmer raids happened November 7, 1919. Uh, and then from, from November through December 21st, he deported 249 resident aliens, mostly uh, pr uh, prominently anarchists. Uh, or what he thought were anarchist. And then it began to grow from there. There's something known as the Soviet Ark. Uh, they began to round up a lot of these individuals they thought were anarchists and, and communists, and actually they put them on a boat named the Buford. The name of the boat was the Buford, and shipped them off to Russia. Right? And this became known as the Soviet Ark. Uh, a more ambitious series of Palmer raids swept through the nation from January 2nd through January 6th, 1920, Authorities arrested 6,000 radicals, 4,000 on a single night, mostly, again, anarchists and members of something called the IWW, International Workers of the World, a labor union. Um, Palmer really didn't go through a lot of what we would say constitutional means to do this, and he became known as the fighting Quaker in America because he was a Quaker, and he was taken on communist. And uh, what happens is on June 2nd of 1920, an anarchist comes to his house and tries to set a bomb while laying this package at his front door. Apparently, he laid it down a little too hard and <laughs> the bomb blew up, killing the anarchist instantly. Uh, this was in a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Obviously, people heard the explosion. People ran out to see what was going on. And a few doors down from where Palmer lived, uh, where his, as his house is literally on fire, is the Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As he's seeing fire engines and police coming down the street, and people running. Uh, he's looking in his yard and he sees a very strange object. And he picks it up and it's a human hand. He finds a human hand in his front yard. Uh, not something I would ever want to find in my front yard. I don't know about you. Um, and this put Mitchell basically into hiding. And he went from no, being known as the fighting Quaker to the quaking fighter. And eventually the Palmer raids by the, the summer of 1920 stopped. 
but America is still very, very much afraid of this immigration that's coming to America. So Congress acts, and in 1921, they pass the Emergency Quota Act. What they do is they go back to the 1910 census, and they look at countries of origin. Let's say you're Italian, and they say, okay, how many Italians came to America in 1910? Well, whatever number that was, only 3% can now enter into the country. 3% of that number. Uh, let's say you were of Polish descent or Russian descent. They go back to the 19th census and say, okay, we're going to limit this to 3%. Um, and this made Americans, you know, feel safe, feel happy. Of course, right around the same time, you have this uh, payroll robbery takes place in upstate Massachusetts. And these two men are arrested. Um, Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, Fernando Sacco and Bartolomo, Bartolomo Vanzetti, uh, Italians, both of whom, it turns out, are anarchists. And in this robbery, uh, two um, security guards will be shot dead. So there's a murder of two men take place. Well, immediately this is Gardner's attention around the country. These men are arrested. There's going to be a trial. It became the trial of the century. Every trial, it seems like, is a trial of the century at this time period. Uh, they're put on trial, and they're found guilty of the murder of these two men. Uh, for the next six years, these two men will exhaust every possible appeal that they have. Eventually, they will be denied as any retrial. Uh, the judge at, at their sentencing actually used the expression, those anarchist bastards, uh, showing you that the judge himself was prejudiced against them. And on August 23rd, 1927, these two men were sent to the electric chair. Um, now, this case actually became very controversial, especially over the years. Uh, any of you may go on to study law. Uh, this is often studied in law courses across the country. There are two legal terms that eventually arise from this. Uh, one word is called culpability. Culpability. Um, C-U-L-P-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y. Culpability. What culpability means, were these individuals actually guilty to begin with? This is something that has often been asked about these two men. What proof do they actually have that they were involved in the shooting? Some people claim there was very little proof, and some of the witnesses that testified against them were forced to testify. And some of the witnesses changed stories. So culpability, were they actually guilty? The other legal term that will eventually come from this is conformance. The word conformance, C-O-N-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E, conformance. That means, was their trial fair to begin with? So the one thing that does come out of this particular trial, Sacco and Vanzetti, is this new understanding of what does it mean to really be guilty and what truly is a fair trial under the U.S. Constitution, culpability and conformance. Well, Americans are still very much afraid of immigration, and eventually the Emergency Quota Act isn't, it doesn't work well enough, and they'll turn to the Immigration Act of 1924. Congress passes the Immigration Act. This one now goes back to the census of 1890. And they look at immigration records then, and they cut it down to now 2%. Whatever was in America in 1980, how many Italians have migrated here by 1980? Germans, Poles, Russians, Czechs, Slovakians, Greeks, you name it. 2%, only 2%. This basically shut the door on Japanese immigration in 1924. Because you can look back at the, the census of 1890, and not a lot of Japanese were coming to America at that time period. So uh, not only did this Immigration Act uh, affect immigrants coming from Europe, but it also would affect immigrants coming from uh, the Pacific, Asia. The 1920s is also the era of the great social experiment known as the 18th Amendment, Prohibition. It comes to us from something known as the Volstead Act or the National Prohibition Act, which was enacted January 30th, 1920. So tomorrow in class, it'll be the 94th anniversary 
or for some of you who might be watching this video uh, down the road, well, then the anniversary is already passed. And anyway, you know, celebrate on your own. Um, prohibition. This idea that you're going to prohibit Americans from selling, transporting alcohol in America. It, it, it really doesn't say anything about consumption, but the idea is that uh, if you can't transport it, you can't sell it, you can't buy it, you can't have it. This brought up a lot of individuals who are going to drink to the point of being punch drunk silly throughout this decade of the 1920s. It is a very silly law because in all honesty, it is completely impossible to enforce. A massive country like the United States and you only have a handful of law enforcers who are going to be, out to be able to go out and try to, to enforce this law. This is a picture here of what's known as a speakeasy. Speakeasies were these hidden saloons, and they could be anywhere. Uh, they could be in a back alley. They could be in somebody's basement in their house. They could be in a school. After school, so they get some classroom. And they put a little speakeasy in there. Uh, anywhere you can hide a saloon. And it was called speakeasies because you tried to be quiet. The, in, that, in the 1920s, they used the expression, you know, speak softly, speak easy, so the neighbors don't hear us and call the cops. Uh, just as a point of reference, um, my, my father's father, my grandfather, uh, who was a Linhart, uh, ran a speakeasy outside of Chicago uh, during Prohibition era. And uh, if you remind me in class, I'll tell you the whole story of how actually Al Capone you see the name down here, put my grandfather out of business because he was basically scared for his life. Uh, bootleggers and rum runners, these are all these interesting terminologies they use. Men who are illegally bringing uh, alcohol into the United States. There are two main points of entry. Key West, which is just south of us. Uh, a lot of rum runners were, were there. Men who, uh, from the Caribbean, mostly Cuba, ran rum and other liquors uh, up from the Keys and got it through the rest of the United States. Interestingly, a Joseph Kennedy, the father of John Kennedy, was a man who made a lot of money in rum running in these days. Uh, bootleggers, again, individuals who brought mostly whiskey and harder uh, spirits from Canada. Um, oftentimes, there was one particular whiskey known as McCoy, and which was a real whiskey, but a lot of times during this time period, people made their own alcohol literally in a bathtub in their house. And oftentimes people would go to these speakeasies and not want to drink some made up liquor. Uh, and they would ask questions like, is it the real McCoy? And that became a huge saying at the time period, the real McCoy. Uh, a lot of fancy drinks were also developed at this time period because again, they were making gin and vodka in their bathtubs that was disgusting so they began to add all, add, add all kinds of punches and fruit juices and colas and eventually things like the martini is invented um, so that's where we get martinis from cosmopolitans and such and such because the alcohol that was a poor quality was so terrible they had to disguise it with other stuff uh, it also helped crime develop in america organized crime uh, the Mafia. Al Capone is perhaps the most notorious and famous of them all. The original Scarface out of Chicago uh, ran the, the, the mob families there. At the height of his empire, he was taking in between 60 and $65 million a year. Of course, they finally got him, not for anything we would actually think of being major criminal, but for tax evasion. Yeah, that's eventually what they got him for. Basically, an accountant brought him to jail. I mean, think about it. The police couldn't catch him. The FBI couldn't catch him. You know, Batman, Superman couldn't catch him. Uh, an accountant, a tax accountant caught the guy, and he goes to jail. He goes to uh, Alcatraz in uh, San Francisco. Uh, the 1920s was also the mass consumption society, uh, building all sorts of refrigerators and... Uh, uh, electrical appliances for the house, radio is going to come of age, Americans after the war are going to start consuming, and it was the growth of the advertisement industry. And interesting, interestingly, many of those men who got into advertisement were part of the propaganda machine of World War I, like George Creel and that Committee of Public Information. They were used to printing all those posters and, and those slogans and trying to get us to do things we normally wouldn't want to do. Well, what exactly is advertisement? But another form of propaganda. Uh, 
One guy who became very famous is a guy named Bruce Barton. Bruce Barton was an uh, he created his own uh, agency, his advertisement agency, became very famous at the time period. He is um, often credited with, but although I don't think you can prove it 100 percent creating a character called Betty Crocker. I think maybe you've heard of Betty Crocker before. But he's more famous for writing a book. He wrote a book, and again, this guy's name is Bruce Barton. He wrote a book called The Man Nobody Knows. And it's all about Jesus. In this book, he claims that Jesus was the greatest salesman the world never really understood. And it became a very popular book in the 1920s. This is also the age of pop culture. We have all types of figures here from the, the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth, the Great Bambino, uh, was originally a Boston Red Sox, but was traded to the Yankees and apparently put a curse on the Boston Red Sox and took him 100 years to win a World Series. Uh, at one point, he held the record for most home runs in a single se season at 60 was considered one of the greatest athletes of the first half of the 20th century. On the other end here, the beginning of professional football. That's Red Grange, the galloping ghost. Of course, it's also the time period where Charles Lindbergh flies solo across the Atlantic Ocean in his spirit of St. Louis. You've got silent movies in the beginning with men like Charlie Chaplin, and Americans really loved going to the movies at this time. But by the end of the 20s, you get the first talking movie, The Jazz Singer. Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer is America's first talking motion picture. Of course, radio is hugely popular. The first official radio broadcast, 1920, KDKA Pittsburgh. It broadcast the election results in November uh, between Warren G. Harding and the uh, Democratic Challengers. And of course, up here, everybody's favorite, Bugs Bunny. No, wait, who's that? Daffy Duck? Uh, Porky? Oh, Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. That's Mickey Mouse. Sorry. Um, Steamboat Willie. Interesting fact. In July of 1928, it was issued as a silent cartoon. But then the jazz singer came out and talking was available. So Walt Disney took it out of uh, circulation and turned it into a talking cartoon and reissued it in November of 1928. So Steamboat Willie not only first introduces us to Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, but is considered the first talking cartoon as well. So this is the age of pop culture. Also the age of intellectual modernism. Uh, one of the great uh, moments of this is the Harlem Renaissance in Harlem, New York. If you remember, we talked about during World War I, the great black migration was taking place uh, where they were leaving the south and heading mostly north, but also to California. But this tripled the population of New York. And then all of a sudden, it exploded in artistic movements, in art, in music, in poetry, in painting, as you see here. And it became known as the Harlem Renaissance. All these great artists and singers and poets were emerging. Uh, they began to draw their roots from Africa and really began to express themselves through African art. Uh, Langston Hughes it was considered the, one of the greatest poets of this time period. Uh, perhaps the most popular part, though, was the music called jazz that comes out of the Harlem Renaissance. Marcus Garvey was a political leader. Uh, the, the universal uh, Negro... Um, uh, I forget the I, uh, <laughs> something association. And I'm ashamed of myself here, and I'm not going to stop this tape because I'm too far into it. Um, you can look in the textbook and see what UNIA stands for, but it was this political movement that starts. Uh, I'm so ashamed of myself. I'll probably look it up, and I'll type it in the comments because I don't have my textbook here in front of me right now. Um, but again, this was the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, intellectual modernism was also a way for others to express themselves artistically. There were other writers known as the Lost Generation. Um, they're called the Lost Generation because these are individuals who witness what they call the horrors of World War I. They began to write about dissent from the norms or what people thought was normal American society. Uh, such famous writers as Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, they critiqued American life in various ways. Uh, many of you have read The Great Gatsby. Uh, perhaps you've seen the movie that recently came out as well. 
Also, changing role for women in the 1920s. Uh, changing lifestyles, changing values with the growth of these massive urban areas like New York and Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, women begin to find more opportunities. Uh, a new sense of sexual awareness happens. This is a picture of what women were called flappers. Uh, they flaunted social norms. Uh, they cut their hair short. They smoked cigarettes in public. Ooh, my word, I cannot believe they're smoking cigarettes in public. Um, and they weren't afraid to basically acknowledge their own sexual awareness, which was a huge taboo at the time period, but they did everything they could to reject what their mothers would have thought about sex. Uh, Margaret Sanger, we've mentioned her once before. She's a doctor who, during this time period, also began to worry that uh, a lot of women did not actually understand their own body because it was against the law. You might have remembered something called the Comstock Law, Anthony Comstock, who became, you know, he was this mailman who thought he was this great police officer of the world, and he decided what was obscene or not. Well, she felt that it was time for women to understand their own bodies, and she wrote a book called What Every Girl Should Know, 1921, and got her in trouble with the Comstock Law. She actually has to flee the country for a little while. Um, she eventually comes back, and she becomes a huge advocate for abortion rights in America, which made her very, very, um, you know, uh, on, on the outskirts with society. You know, a lot of people very much did not like Margaret Sanger, but she fought hard. Again, this is a time period where the roles of women are changing, but not just in this way, but also, as we know, with the voting rights. The 19th Amendment has been passed. 1920 saw the first presidential election where women across the country had the right to vote. Although, ironically, they turned out in a very low uh, uh, voting force as, as women. But it also began to, we began to understand that the, the, the idea of separate spheres, the, the cult of domesticity is changing. You know, it's not an extension, it's an extension now of women's rights, not a rejection. Um, people began to wonder about maternal issues as well, with all the changing roles of women there are two court cases that happened, one in 1908, actually, on the out, just before the 1920s, Mueller uh, versus Oregon, and then Children's Hospital versus Atkins in 1923. Both these are about sex discrimination. Mueller dealt with the idea of, can you, can you give maximum hours to women on a job? Is that right? Women who are child bearers, should they work overtime? Should they work 60 and 70 hours a week? And this idea was that that would be wrong, you know, to force them to work maximum hours. And in the children's hospital, dealt with minimum wage. Should there be a minimum wage protection for women? Well, now that women have the right to vote, they should get no federal protection or special protection from the government. So in the uh, Atkins case, they voted down the idea of a minimum wage for women. Of course, women are now going and getting jobs in factories, and they're getting jobs all across America. They're getting, they were highly involved in the temperance movement that eventually led to prohibition. So women are getting, becoming more and more involved in various facets now of our society, and we can start to see what is now the modern feminine idea, uh, that a woman has a right to choose to either become a wife, become an activist, to go to college, to have a career, and it's starting to emerge here in the 1920s. Uh, we'll end it also with a religious revival that takes place during this time period. You might remember the last time I really talked about religion was after the Civil War. Americans became very discouraged in a lot of respects and allowed for Darwinism and the teaching of evolution, uh, social Darwinism, the idea that, uh, that people are just better uh, because of genetics, and then a fundamentalist movement emerged as well. And it dies out a little bit, but by the turn of the century, the, the rise of fundamentalism comes back, especially in attacking the idea of evolution. And that's the strange little court case that takes place in all places of the world, Dayton, Tennessee, 1925. John T. Scopes was a biology teacher. And he walked into his classroom one day, and he, he didn't say the word evolution, but he talked in terms of biology that made someone believe he was talking about single cell organisms and coming all the way up to what is man without using the word evolution. And Tennessee had passed a law that it was against the law to teach evolution. 
So he actually gets arrested. Here's a high school teacher who's arrested for teaching the concept of evolution. It became a, it became a major trial. Uh, representatives from newspapers from all over the United States, from Europe, from Asia, they all came to Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, Clarence Darrow was the famous lawyer of the time period. He's a lawyer with an organization known as the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and he came to represent Scopes to fight on his behalf that the law in Tennessee was wrong. And so uh, the, the people who are prosecuting Scopes that want him to, basically he was going, he was going to pay a fine. He actually wasn't going to go to jail. He had to pay a fine. But they got the help of William Jennings Bryan. You remember this guy? Ran for president three different times, cross of gold speech, silver and gold, 16 ounces to one ounce. That William Jennings Bryant came to Dayton, Tennessee to fight for the prosecution of Scopes, to find him guilty. Um, it, was, it was really a case that was decided before it ever happened. Uh, Scopes is going to be guilty no matter what, and Darrow knew it. Every time he tried to bring an expert witness on evolution to the, to the stand, he was always denied. He was never allowed to talk about science. And finally, in the end, he did a, a very interesting thing. As a lawyer, he called on the other lawyer, Brian, to take the stand. Of course, it confused everybody there. Why are you asking the prosecuting attorney to take the stand? He says, well, William Jennings Bryan says that he's an expert in religion. So he brought him up there and he kept him up there. Now, this is during the summer, and it was so hot in the courtroom that they actually had to go outside to have the trial. It was so hot, and he kept him on the stand for nearly an hour, just bad-mouthing him and, and talking about uh, things in the Bible that Darrow thought were foolish. And, um, and poor Brian, he's, he's heavier than he ever was. He's older, and he's sweating, and he's sweating. And, of course, they have to call for recess, and eventually Darrell loses. He loses the case, uh, but eventually gets appealed. And a couple of days later, William Bryan, the great orator, the prairie lion of the West, perhaps the image of the cowardly lion of the Wizard of Oz book, Mr. Cross of Gold guy himself, passes away of a heart attack. Um, Darrow would later remark that he did not die of a broken heart. He died of a busted belly because he apparently was a big eater. Um, but that brings us to an end of a great era, in a way, of, of Brian. And the end, he still represents the old Gilded Age period. And the 1920s, in a lot of respects, is the beginning of a new era in America. Uh, an era of prosperity is happening, uh, changing roles of women, uh, how we think of terms of immigration now coming to America, something that we're still very much fighting about, even in our time period. Uh, wealth, who who has more wealth and less wealth in America. These are being fought and divided over. Americans are investing in the stock market more than ever. Uh, pop culture, uh, popular music, it's all exploding here in the 1920s, and it's going to come to a sudden thud end in 1929, and that's something we'll pick up in the next lecture. Don't forget to go into Edmodo and print out the video log that's uh, specifically designed for this lesson. All right, talk to you guys later.